Good evening and welcome to the USC School of Architecture Spring Lecture Series. I am absolutely delighted to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Jessica Varner. Dr. Varner is currently a postdoctoral fellow at USC Society of Fellows in the Humanities, where she is affiliated with USC School of Architecture. She received her PhD in History, Theory, Criticism of Art and Architecture from MIT in 2020 with a dissertation entitled Chemical Desires, Dyes, Additives, Foams, and the Making of Architectural Modernity. She also has MARC and MED degrees from Yale University. She has been a Martin Society Fellow at the Martin Society of Fellows in the Environment, a Fulbright Research Fellow in Karlsruhe, a pre-doctoral visiting fellow at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, and a doctoral fellow at the Canadian Centre for Architecture in Montreal as part of the Architecture's Environmental Histories Working Group. This summer, she will be a Haas Fellow at the Science History Institute in Philadelphia. Dr. Varner's publications include the 2011 book, No More Play, Conversations on Urban Speculation in Los Angeles and Beyond, which she co-authored with Michael Malson. The forthcoming volume, Toxics, which she is co-editing with Meredith Ten Hoor and the forthcoming co-authored book, Climate Changed, Modeling Pasts, Presents, and Futures. Her current book project, Chemical Desires, Chemical Modernities, When Modern Architecture Met the Chemical Industry, is scheduled to be published with University of Chicago Press. I would also like to make sure that our students know that Jessica Varner will be teaching her course, City and Environmental History, here in the School of Architecture next fall and next spring. She's currently teaching it uh, this semester as well. I'm very much looking forward to her talk tonight, which is entitled, This is a Pipeline, Dow Oil and Gas Byproducts, New Architectural Products and Chemical Modernity. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jessica Varner. Awesome. Thank you so much for that great introduction. Share my screen. Great, yeah. Thank you to the USC Lecture Committee and Dean Curry for the generous invitation to share my work today. And thank you, Victoria, for your kind and warm introduction. As Victoria noted, I'm an architectural historian trained in environmental history um, and science and technology studies at MIT. But it's equally important to note uh, that I'm tr a trained architect and an environmental advocate um, working with the Environmental Data and Governance Initiative, or EDGY for short. And while my talk tonight, this is a pipeline, selling new proprietary plastics, that well, and architectural chemical modernity and ethylene is a historical case study, historical case study on how oil developments at Dow Chemical led to new chemical building products, mainly rigid styrofoam and plastic coatings, being a historian sharpens and gives evidentiary bearing, bearings for my current advocate and pushes against the stubborn histories I reveal tonight. Advocacy work for a better chemical environmental regulation practices in the US and beyond and open material transparency data, part of a larger right to know movement in building products and beyond. Additionally, my talk bibliography is open access on my website as well in spirit of open access and open data. So let's begin. So in 1913, Lily Reich, the influential German modernist designer, collaborator of Mies van der Rohe and Deutsche Werkbund member presented this humble chemical display for the Elefanten Apotheke appearing here in the same year in the Verkbahn Jahrbuche. The small modern pharmaceutical window display symmetrically arranged chemicals in elemental form. On opposite sides, white labeled opaque vials held base chemicals joined together and instruments, mortar, pestle, utensils, and distillation tubes lay arranged at the bare display base. Grace, grounding this tripartite display, presenting all chemicals equivalent and modern. Reich's chemistry niche offered a new aesthetic understanding of an emerging chemical life, clean, modern, and without visible origins. Not unlike window display aesthetics at the time, 
Reich's design distanced commercial products from material supply sources, notably lacking once valued authenticity claims of raw materials from this far country or that. Her apotheca rendered chemical matter almost invisible, hidden in tin labeled containers and liquid beakers, observable yet abstract. So this display signaled a break at European modernism start. The sleek bare exhibition design masked and muted the powerful potential and harm within chemical consumer products, showing compounds as modern, ushering up in progressive products with new formulas under new chemical patronage. But Lily Reich was not alone. At the turn of the 20th century, architects navigated new processes and materials as chemical corporations employed, corporations employed novel research strategies, exhibitions, advertising, and sponsorship to conscript architects, builders, and engineers as enthusiastic exponents of their products while simultaneously unknowing harm, masking supply chains, adjusting building codes and launching chemical true squads, they were actually called, to offset mounting environmental and human health concerns. The result was one of the most successful and toxic material transformations in modern history. The change defined a new era of chemical modernity in architecture and building, turning architecture into a pipeline for chemical, petrochemical products from emerging technologies and coal, oil and gas exploration. And while Reich's display offers us an anchor at the beginning of the 20th century in Germany, my talk today focuses on the US in the mid-century moment. In the midst of the second industrial revolution, right in the middle of the chemical century. As coined by Fortune magazine shown here in March 1940, the chemical century defined a new era of invention and economic gain. Economic gain. The chemical century, exhilarating chemical inventions and corporate industrial processes, but also petrochemical palettes, forceful marketing strategies, and advantageous building codes, inadequate regulations, dark chemical lands, environments, environmental injury, and bond. as buildings became chemical and modern material inventions met synthetic chemical risk without resolve, a process I call the new chemical modernity. It was a moment of prolific change in architecture at the turn of the 20th century. Architects, designers, and builders negotiated new industrial technological developments, rolled plate glass, stainless steel, elevators, and central heating and air conditioning systems. But most critically, chemical engineering's relentless pursuit created perpetually new products, invisible materials, and eternally durable substances. As materia, or raw chemical matter became imbued with this desirable qualia or engineered qualities available only via the new growing classes of synthetic chemicals, be it qualities that were fireproof, vivid, or durable. But one by one, trouble, but one by one troubles were stacking up and that the desirable material qualities coveted by architects and consumers derived from synthetic chemical compounds had consequences creating pigments so permanent they endure in all organic bodies, making additives so invisible they, remove, they remain embedded in foil, manufacturing products so new they continue to evade regulatory oversight. The consequences were at once material, social, technological, philosophical, spatial, economic, and environmental. So tonight, in conversation with recent scholarship, including Anne Murphy's Product Unknowing, Anit Singh's Supply Chain Capitalisms, Eve Tuck's Investment in Innocence, Sarah Wiley's Chemical Bonds, and Naomi Oreski and Eric Conway's Constructed Corporate Uncertainties and Corporate Funded Science, I question today through the case study of U.S. Dow ethylene building products how certain decisions in Dow's chemical engineering laboratory new abundant ethylene sources, the rise in lobbying interest groups such as the NAHB, the National Association of Home Builders, and architecture's quest for innovative new products, innovative new products raise more, including how did architecture and its products become a pipeline for oil and gas products? What are the ethical implications of rendering architecture and its building products chemical? And how is modernism accountable? accountable? 
And today I have a chemical, a chapter from my forthcoming book, which Victoria mentioned, Chemical Desires, Chemical Modernities. But overall, I research big global co chemical corporations, BSF, Schoenier, Monsanto, and Dow, in their gated corporate records, but also through FOIA requests and in collaboration with Right to Know archives and industrial transparency efforts, which is why on some of my slides tonight, you'll see stamped with litig litigation exhibition marks. I researched these companies because they controlled and continue to control architecture's industrial building materials in the chemical century. By examining corporate chemical engineering histories, my research exposes how architects and the building materials market allowed and encouraged these changes as buildings became one of the chemical, indus in chemical industry's primary instruments. So now on to the evidence. <laughs> In 1941, motivated to create an economy of cheap products as World War II saw supply chains break and material rations took hold, ethylene emerged as a base feedstock within the Dow laboratory under the auspice of in innovation as Dow founded its subsidiary firm, Dow Well, otherwise known as its oil and gas exploratory arm. And product development from ethylene, a volatile, often toxic oil and gas byproduct, started, quote, the moment the tap turned on, or when Dow began investing in cracking, now known as fracking techniques. Shortly after, in the mid-1940s, Dow Chemical targeted building materials for growth as military contracts slowed, excuse me, the lights are going off, <laughs> slowed and architectural needs increased in the post-World War II U.S. housing boom. Collaborations between Dow chemists, the Dow physics lab, and the Dow sales department, and architects like Alvin Dow, Dow Chemical Air, produced a host of new applications, including polystyrene insulation, plastic coatings, and polymer additives. The world is the result was the chemist, as shown here in one of Dow's very early chemistry um, advertisements for the home. But let me turn to the point where it all started. Because before products, products, cheap resources were required. In the late 1930s and early 1940s, Dow's synthetic chemical compounds shifted to use a limited palette of oil and gas derivatives from new cracking, as I mentioned, now known as fracking techniques. Starting in the 1930s, Dow founded the subsidiary Dow Well Services, later known as Dow Well, shown here in the advertisement, which improved oil flows across non-proprietary wells throughout the United States. However, Dow's dependence on external sources at the time was proving increasingly expensive and unreliable. So in 1940, Dow Chemical purchased approximately 1,000 acres in Velasco and Freeport, Texas, along the Brazos River, while the companies and that's shown here on the right and the chemical town is on your left. So while the company's initial interest in Texas, be interest in Texas began with magnesium, they shortly added units for bromine, chlorine, and other petrochemical um, bases for product expansion. So really to prevent possible supply chain disruptions, the plant constructed direct ethylene and propane pipeline pipelines to feed the Freeport plant. So if Herbert Dow built the Midland, Michigan plant on cheap pine lumber, where Dow chemical itself originated at the turn of the 20th century, the Freeport, Texas plant was built on cheap gas. In the 1940s, the estimated usage was 30 million cubic feet of natural gas daily for producing the host of all the gas derivatives they needed. And in 1946, the Dow General Research Committee explored further how shale oil could be converted into useful bases such as benzene and more ethylene. And in 1947, Dow Chemical established its subsidiary, Bra Brasso's Oil and Gas Company in Texas combined with over 265,000 oil and gas leases in Texas and California. The company expanded further into Texas, Michigan, and California Michigan and California in 1950. In the 50s and 60s, Dow Oil and Gas Division expanded into Ohio, Louisiana, Wyoming, Oklahoma, Colorado, Kansas, Nebraska, Florida, and New Mexico. Through investment in oil and gas, Dow ensured cheap, abundant supplies for engineered products for years to come. 
So as Dow shifted from base chemical sales to selling proprietary chemical compounds in the 1920s, new, or the concept of new, epitomized Dow chemical philosophy. And to really to facilitate this transition in 1922, the company created the Dow Physical Research Laboratory, shown here in a very early iteration in one of the rooms. And it was later referred to as the Dow Physics Lab, located on the factory production site, solely to develop new chemical compounds and products. The physics lab was established in Midland, Michigan, within the sprawling Dow Chemical Works complex, part research and part plant on the riverfront of the Pine, Chippewa, and Tipuasi rivers, Dow Chemical positioned itself at the energy intensive, energy intensive industrial next salt extraction, white pine lumber, and petrochemical futurities. A later physics lab director, Raymond F. Boyle, F. Boyle recalled an example of around chemical experience of the time experiments at the time in the lab. He said, quote, during my period of leadership in the physics lab, and I called out the important point here, I obtained from the Midland Police Department a confiscated slot machine instead of the usual apples, pears, and peaches. I wrote on the first wheel the names of monomers. On the second wheel, the same or different group of monomers, which could then be used as co-monomers. And the third wheel contained additives such as plasticizers, fillers, colors, stabilizers, etc. This chemical slot machine was real, but it became uh, Dow's operational model as well. As the company created as many products from cheap synthetic substances in chemical modernity's gamble. So in the 30s, as I mentioned prior, Dow's styrene mania came about due to one particular factor, which I mentioned prior, which I mentioned prior. The company cheap supply of less than useful resource ethylene. So ethylene is a naturally occurring substance found in fruits, which encourages ripening, but it's also a sweet aromatic hydrocarbon gas created in the new, cra in the new cracking techniques with cold deposits. It forms the basis for many compounds, including early, which was used in weaponry and mustard gas and rubber shown here an ethylene unit of a mustard gas factory in Maryland. In 1931, the company built a new ethylene plant um, at the company head William H. Dow's direction, and subsequently the plant produced more ethylene than the company could use. And rather than turn off the extraction tap, W.H. Dow charged the physics laboratory chemist to find use for the surplus. So from 1931 to 1933, a third of the physics lab's members, a team of 15, including lead chemist shown here, Dr. Sylvia Stoesser, were dedicated to improving styrene production, styrene production, a substance primary with ethylene and benzene, and to find new uses for the compound. Styrene, a name given to the substance originally derived from resin or oil of the storax tree in the mid 18th century, was a malleable scientific byproduct of Dow petroleum exploits. As Ray Bundy, fellow physics lab scientist discerns, quote, one of the really difficult problems with polystyrene was the fact that it etched and it got soggy and foggy on the surface, end quote. In other words, early formulas made the product less than aesthetically pleasing. The physics lab's original results working with the material were unstable and aesthetically undesirable and the compound was not yet useful. So Dr. Sylvia Stoesser, the chief scientist on the project, attempted to make the new entity styrene more commercially viable, eventually making a styrene monomer linked together to make a polymer, in other words, a usable plastic. So as World War II took hold, Dow's excess styrene proved advantageous. Dow, Dow found ways to implement time production, including in buoys, flotation devices, synthetic rubber, and other equipment needs. And as a result, from 1937 to 1945, Dow produced and sold over 200 million pounds of styrene. Dow Chemical also filed over 500 patents, including ethylene and its processes shown here from 1940 to 1945. 
So finally, in abundance, supplies in Texas made its way via pipelines to Midland, Michigan for production, then out into the world as products. But something that this diagram erases is that styrene can also be, in different compound formulas, a disastrous material that causes harm to human and environmental health, including neurological effects, cancer risks, alongside long-term exposure linked to serious reproductive issues. Often chemical effects and harm are only evident after decades of toxicological studies. However, the chemicals that constitute styrene and eventually expanded polystyrene styrofoam have long presented risks at varying scales. And this is one of the memos. This is one of the memos um, that some of those earlier risks. So given the newness of styrofoam, Dow needed ways to sell this experimental product. At the turn of the 20th century, industrial chemistral chemical engineering companies including responded by creating in-house product sales and public relations departments, mainly to advertise a new, quote, diversity of products. Dow hired photographers to publicize factory growth, such as this ethylene series by Torkel Corling, used in Time Magazine and other publications, as well as company promotional materials. The modernist dynamic composition made the styrene factory abstract in black and white with clean lines, highlighting synthetic chemical production as modern and hygienic. But most significantly, the sales and physics laboratory at Dow communicated to find new markets to expand its products. And as World War II left a significant gap in styrene demand, at the same time, the United States experienced a post-war housing shortage. Thus Dow, saw, thus, Dow saw an opportunity. Dow targeted interior and exterior building materials for new substantial growth, including Dow's production of polystyrene. As reported in an internal Dow Chemical memo about this period, quote, the Dow Chemical Company has been involved in research of materials of construction since its very beginning, end quote. The company purposely targeted the growing building and construction economy to create new demands. The, the Dow Physics Laboratory shifted its research, focusing heavily on new styrene building products with malleable qualities including expanded polystyrene for wall, ceiling, roof, and foundation insulation, marked under the trademark styrofoam. Existing common natural uh, eelgrass and rock wool insulations were replaced with a new Dow chemical alternative. As styrofoam building insulation required technical expertise to understand, draw, and build for new applications, the architectural profession was crucial to the product's success. Architects were essentially at the front line, and like the tobacco industry of the time, if Dow was tobacco's, pro was tobacco's product, modern architectural products were Dow's. So in the 1930s and 40s, architectural product advertising was commonplace. Think Sweets Catalog or the inside of Progressive Architecture magazine. In 1937, the U.S. Journal Architectural Forum even observed the building industry was, quote, becoming aware of the major advertising trends, including methods customarily used to bolster the sale of cigarettes, cosmetics, and breakfast foods, end quote. Here, an example where a male material sample of PCB coated metal, or here, a styrofoam specification sheet mailed to architects and engineers in the United States to sell proprietary Dow styrofoam for, quote, designing people, end quote. Or in-person demonstrations held at industrial trade shows, such as here. Bold photography, scientific-like associations, and inflated claims sold architectural products like cigarettes, as architects and designers were seen as malleable consumers. Yet new pl plastics, like styrofoam, entered the architectural and construction field with mixed reception. As evident in, 19, as evident in 1940, architecture article, quote, plastics and architecture, discussing the profession's complaints about chemically engineered modernity. Quote, even architects who took school courses in chemistry are mildly baffled by the new comprising such, a, such astonishing combinations of toilet, cellulose acetate, biorite and vinyl chloride, end quote. Some of those were actually incorrect. Yet the magazine deemed the materials, quote, sympathetic and praised plastics generally for their, quote, 
new material advantages. Yet even as the profession was cautiously adopting new plastics, just four years prior in Architectural Record article, historian and critic Lewis Mumford was not so sure about plastics advantages. He summarized the material transition in building and construction as part of a larger trend towards, quote, car carboniferous capitalism, end quote. Understanding that products derived from petrochemicals had consequences. He saw the building's industries transition to more energy intensive practices and petrochemical sources as detrimental to society. However, no one was a more, quintess a more quintessential advocate ex than architect Alden B. Dow, whose parents were Herbert H. Dow, founder of Dow Chemical and philanthropist Grace Dow. Alden initially pursued studies in chemical engineering at the University of Michigan, but with little success, he came back to the Dow Midland plant and then transferred to the architecture program at Columbia. After graduation in 1931, Dow worked for several months with Frank Lloyd Wright and returned to Midland, Michigan to start his own office with similar Wrightian modern aesthetic sensibilities. As an architect, Alden Dow pushed to popularize Dow products. In his first commission in 1930, as a graduate student actually, Alden filled the lounge areas of the new Midland Chemical Event Hall with Dow metal magnesium chairs shown here and hung experimental Dow lighting above the ballroom floor. In 1930, Fortune magazine described Midland's context, the place where Alden Dow worked and where the plant existed, plant existed as an industry could exist, balance between country and city, where, quote, wilderness would be tamed and civilization would flourish, end quote. Alden utilized the patronage, patron of wealth of managers, executives, and bureaucrats who had money to spend an interest in taming Midland's, quote, wilderness. Alden's influence shifted to the town's modern architectural preferences towards US modernist traditions with a twist. He championed comfort and reliance on consumer products and technological advantage. And essentially the entire town is um, basically a part of a mid-century modern movement. So entire neighborhoods look exactly like the slide you see today. So in 1937, Alden developed a styrene sheet also while covering to made to fit a standard framing at 11 and three quarters of an inch by 12 inches. He detailed the product with a cock joint and advertised new ways to use the sheet in the Dow Company Magazine feature, as well as presenting it here in the July 1940 issue of Architectural Record. Architectural Record. This is a chemical exposition that Dow, Alden Dow had installed in the Dow Company. Additionally, the styrene sheets adorned the Dow Chemical main office building, Dow Chemical Pavilion in the 1939 San Francisco Golden Gate Exposition, as well as walls and ceilings of the Midland Community Bathhouse. So each new Dow product use challenged building practices and pushed Dow products into mainstream construction. Alden would also use, later use rigid styrofoam on many of his projects, including one of his most reputable commissions, and as the old adage says, follow the money, the home of Dow Chemicals third president, Leland Ted Doan, shown here on your left um, with JFK. So as a self-proclaimed modernist, Alden Dow capitalized on his connections to the Dow Corporation and its employees and produced homes um, for the local Midland community. Here, this is Leland Dow's plan. So he, produ so he produced out for Dow and its employees a ready crowd of clients hungry for modern architecture pre-saturated with chemical desires. And this is more from Leland's commission. Alden's commissions were colorful, indulgent, with padded synthetic carpet covered rooms filled with cold artificial air blocking out the wasps of sweet benzene from machines down the street. However, from the beginning, Dow styrofoam was not an easy product to sell. The modified stiff plastic polymer required creative, sometimes coercive marking. 
Such rigid modular insulation required complex technical details and skilled labor during construction to achieve adequate thermal performance. In the late 1940s, as Dow prepared to put expanded polystyrene or EPS into production, Dow's market research for the product came back very negative. Yet Alden Dow pushed back. He claimed that it was impossible to do market research on a new unique material, quote, with no past, how could the future be predicted, end quote. As a board of member, directors member, he encouraged development of the development of the insulation despite risk. Alden was convinced it would sell. Dow polystyrene and Alden Dow's promotion of it provide an all too perfect pairing of chemical corporate interest, innovation desires, and the under-regulated commercial product market which allowed harmful products to proliferate. So as Dow targeted the building industry as a site for potential growth, the Dow sales department developed new relationships with interest groups related to the construction industry. At the same time as ethylene became a key chemical in industrial chemical engineering, the National Home Builders Association formed in the US. Coverage here of one of the NAHB, the National Home Builders Association conventions, shown here in House and Home in 1952. It was a large crowd. The US was facing material hardships and shortages at the time, as the World, excuse me, the War Production Board, the WPB, was established as a government agency in 1942 by executive order of FDR. The WPB directed peacetime industries to meet war needs and allocated scarce materials vital to war production. Important to the building, the WPB also established priorities in the distribution of material services and prohibited certain things, such as the use of metals, rubber, paper, and plastics. So founded in 1942, the NAHB, just one year after Dow patented its formula and process for styrofoam, the NAHB, a trade association, and currently to mention one of the largest lobbying uh, groups in Washington, D.C., so still around, began to promote and protect the interest of home builders, developers, and architects. The NAHB was founded by powerful leaders with deep connections in the home building industry who controlled and influenced local and federal regulation in a multitude of ways, including pushing against growing restrictions on building stocks. Joseph Marion, shown here, the NAHB's president in 1945, worked to limit the restrictive materials priority system. And Joseph Meyerhoff, president in 1946, focused his term on lobbying to remove government restrictions on home building. And finally, Rodney, Rodney, Rodney Lockwood, president in 19, was a builder and a lawyer who developed comprehensive reports to encourage diverse material use and was a member of the U.S. President Advisory Committee on Housing Policies and Programs. And outside of leadership, the NAHB established several initiatives to push new material use. A building research advisory board established in 1946, which was founded in part to review and promote new innovations in building materials and technologies. And in 1948, the NAHB also established a technical services division to provide expertise and review technical information for builders for guidance on new products and materials. But finally, in 1952, the NAHB formed the Home Builders Research Institute, the HBRI, a privately funded group that evaluated both government and privately sponsored research findings about new products and field tested chemical materials, filling this gap between the chemical laboratory and the building site. And in this regard, the NAHB funded a program of research houses to test materials and the first NAHB research house opened in 1957 after two years, of design, two years of design and material specimen research institute trustees. Constructed in Kensington, Maryland, this small 1,300 square foot house contained three bedrooms and two baths with an attached garage. The structure's modern aesthetic built by local craftsman Clark Daniel used modular dimensioning and featured products from 13 product manufacturers. Masonite walls and siding, DuPont spray on granular roof, a Frigidaire and General Motors sealed combination air conditioning and heating unit, and listed at the end of manufacturers was plastic foam edge insulation for the slab foundation by Dow Chemical. 
The National Home Bidders Association, an advocate for styrene products, received early product samples to use the NAHB research house, and in turn, NAHB provided recommendations to a consortium of builders and architects via promotional materials, workshops, and writing the products into local and national building codes. That same year, 1957, the Dow Annual Report charted record growth. Quote, record sales were again attained for the 1957 fiscal year, totaling 600, 628 million for an 11% gain over the preceding year, end quote. The lobbying interest of the NAHB, Alden Dow's work, the styrene patents from the Dow Physics Laboratory, each illustrate this euphoria for new, cheap, chemically engineered products derived from petrochemical resources. As the company interest became deeply intertwined in oil and gas extraction in Midland, Michigan, Freeport, Texas, and beyond. But what are the aesthetic, legal, and ethical implications of rendering architecture and its building products chemical? As building materials transform from whole stocks to petrochemical derived formulas, evidence really scattered around as one compound changed names or one patent transferred to another for production. And this unknowing synthetic chemical building materials or what historian of science uh, Robert Proctor defines as agnotology, the process of structurally forgetting underpins each facet of chemical modernity. The how or why we don't know about synthetic chemical building materials is just as important as what we do know. The fact that we are unaware of the architecture profession's connection to this connection to the ethylene pipelines and that is not unplanned. So returning, if I can, to M. Murphy's argument that we are living in, quote, a chemical regime largely produced by over a century of petrochemical dependent industrialized capitalism, where these varied molecular modification range and duration, mobility and effect offering us a world changed in ways both subtle and overwhelming, end quote. Despite the 1970s environmentalism, growing public awareness and increasing environmental regulations, Dow persisted and excelled in the building and construction trades, including in building EPS, styrofoam and styrene products. Alden Dow, his use of new Dow chemical products and his ever expanding industrial patron, Dow Chemical, its employees and its oil and gas subsidiary gains rendered architecture's chemical modernity in ethylene, setting the architecture profession's fate reliant on materials made from synthetic organic chemicals extracted from oil and natural gas. And this is the picture today in the ethylene pipeline with Freeport, Texas being one of the major niches and Midland and Midland still remain. So in conclusion, what's at stake? Architects and architectural historians do not often see the history of chemical engineering, synthetic chemical development, and the oil and gas industry as integral to the historiography of modern architecture. But my research really proves otherwise. As the climate crisis looms and we protest to push to end our reliance on fossil fuels, architecture history has the opportunity to change too. In studying the, instead of looking to artistic intention, one could look at uh, product specifications, such as Dow insulation, which provides a different veil on modern architecture. Or instead of understanding an architect's biography or educational background, looking to the history of what is unknown about synthetic compounds to corporate responsibility, lobbying interest groups, and corporate chemical profit ledgers might recast modern architecture's history. So as I've shown, architects specified synthetic chemical building materials with gusto. They align with and benefit from chemical patronage. They helped to establish and establish and adhere to a weaning product regulation system in regional and national building codes, which encouraged and required often these industrial produced materials. So tonight I want to conclude with one thought that chemical modernity is architecture's history. So thank you for this talk tonight. And I'll stop share. Thank you so much, Jessica, for that fascinating paper. I am, um, so I am here to moderate questions and people can feel free to uh, put questions in the Q&A and or the, uh, the chat so I can um, 
and I can uh, ask them to Jessica. So and I just got the note about the skipping, so I apologize if y'all missed anything. <laughs> that's okay. It was you were we we could still understand you. It was just a little bit of a um, every once in a while there was a little bit of a skip. Um, maybe I'll just uh, start off with a with a question and uh, and really it was such a fascinating paper and and in particular I think you really. Uh, evoked so clearly this notion of these materials whose qualities are so malleable and changeable and um, that kind of image of that slot machine where there's this process of permutation where you can decide what what qualities you want to generate depending on um, you know what combination of things and and I was wondering whether um, I was kind of thinking of, of everything that you presented and then versus a, you know a modernist ethos of truth to materials right and essentially, did these two things ever come into direct conflict? Or is this more of a kind of pre-World War II, post-World War II switch? Or is it that the materials are hidden and so they never became, you know, part of a problem in that? But obviously that, you know, how can you talk about a kind of essential quality of these materials when it, their, their power is exactly the opposite? Yeah, that's a great question. And the, there's an amazing scholar, um, there's an amazing book, it's Pamela Smith's uh, Imitative Architecture, um, that really talks about this span and talks about how imitative material at the time, um, so things that emulated concrete or things that emulated brick, weren't actually under fire as much as people, as people imagine that this when cheap materials came in play, um, really switched the conversation because at sort of this, as you point out, so it's at both end, this World War II moment, the pre-war, post-war, where cost really and availability um, was a key prior, priority question. And the NAHB, the National Association of Home Builders, really points this, this crux when um, essentially trying to build was almost impossible because material availability um, was so rationed. And so really reading through the ledger notes of certain meetings and having them understand that um, they just needed to build um, at this time when there was just not the material to build. It echoes in some ways, if you think about today as supply, you know, in the COVID moment when supply chains broke, um, you could really understand. And if anyone's an architect in the room, I'm sure there are, um, to order marble was, um, you know, to order a slab for a kitchen or your, you know, kitchen cabinets, um, because when supply chain, when supply chains break is when you really on how important base materials are. And so actually it's, it's surprising how much the conversation really changed just due to material availability and um, low, as things became more low cost um, and available to a more democratic public. Um, truth material was a very interior architectural discussion, um, less of a larger consumer democratic um, issue. And actually, to, just to follow up, we have a, a question from Josh Lappin, who wants, uh, want, would like you to say more about the origins of the NAHB, uh, where in the U.S. did it begin, and who actually first organized it? Yeah, so the NAHB is a fascinating history, and there's a great um, scholar who talks a little bit about its issues in terms of race um, and mortgage lending. So the NAHB was also um, involved in securing a mortgage to certain backers, but the NAHB was founded um, primarily um, in a group of developers in the Midwest, in Chicago, um, and beyond. So in Michigan, actually, several of the early presidents were in Michigan, but was founded um, in, um, in uh, uh, builders that were interested in building more, really at the time um, when the war moment when people were having trouble building. So by forming an association, um, by forming networks of, um, to really push, I mean, these early NAHB members and presidents were pushing against these material restrictions with gusto, with fervor. They were really upset that um, they couldn't build and essentially in many ways make profit. Um, so, by watching architects and builders really get into policy at the time, really get involved with larger federal policy to really um, advocate for 
um, advocate within um, a larger federal presidential system um, for material availability, um, you see how important it really was um, um, for people to organize the NIHB in particular, but it also had a, quite a dark side. Um, the NIHB is, uh, it's a, it's a consortium of developers, essentially. Um, and so it really did have an underbelly of profit, um, of course, um, of course, um, sold on democratic housing, but um, profit was the underlying, um, we'll say, ethos um, in the foundation of NHB as material supply chains broke and they really needed to advocate um, in larger groups for allowing building to happen at all. So thank okay. you for your question, Josh. Thank you. Um, so another question from Trudy Sandmeyer, who says, I love your take on architectural historian as activist. How can you, how can this research inform our efforts towards sustainability? How should we as members of the building industrial complex mine this work to reduce the impact of these products today? Aside, of course, from eliminating vinyl windows, which are evil. It's true, Trudy. Um, in many ways, there's, uh, so many ways to get involved. Um, if anyone is interested, EDGY is a group that I'm a part of. So I spend part of my time advocating with the Environmental Data Governance Initiative, which I um, mentioned at the beginning, um, but really working with a nonprofit group. And our the ethos of the group is for transparent data from the government available um, to the public, to the public. And uh, to, and we specifically are focused on environmental data. So EPA enforcement, material transparency, the TASCA, the Toxic Substance Control Act, all of these, um, all of these ways that we can really get involved within policy. Um, that's one way that you can do it, I would say, uh, get involved. But I do think that what's really important, what I think it's hard to understand without really talking it through, is how stuck um, these regulations and these mechanisms of production are within the system and hopefully showing the span that how long it really took to get this product in, um, how hard it is to get it out. Um, because in many ways, the chemical industry is big <laughs> and very powerful. And so I think from behind the sort of underbelly of the talk, I hope gets at um, just how big and how powerful um, the chemical uh, industry is, the industrial chemical building industry is, um, in, in understanding really how entrenched um, these production practices are. Um, it's, in, it's, in other words, it's, and this might be slightly controversial, it's incredibly difficult um, to be sustainable if you, in terms of the industrial chemical complex. Um, it's in so many things, um, and they're not all bad. Um, it's hard to, and that's the thing, um, the chemical industry, it's not all bad. Um, obviously, I think today in terms of, as we learn, um, pharmaceutical production is also connected to the same developments, um, is connected to uh, the chemical building industry. So, um, there are always pluses and minuses to innovation, um, but to understand, um, to really begin to advocate for um, more material transparency laws is a first start um, because it really is very difficult due to the proprietary law and intellectual law and intellectual property laws isn't even in our building materials. So it's a stuck system. And the book talks a little bit larger about how those regulations really are play. And this is just one little snippet um, into the US context um, versus, the, um, versus the German context, but really um, these regulatory practices are um, Um, maybe just to, uh, uh, while we're waiting to see and if other questions come in, um, along these lines, I think you are giving us a bit of a hint of some of the difficulties involved in the kind of research that you do. And, um, you know, you began the talk by, by referring to these stubborn histories. And so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about some of those methodological uh, challenges that, that you face as, as you do this kind of important work. Of course. Um, and I think, thanks, of course, the methodological question as a historian, I always love it. 
Um, I think what's really important to understand is that um, there's a reason why certain architects are um, are, um, are explored because a lot archival saving um, does a lot for histories. When things are saved, it's very easy to tell those histories. So building material formulas and chemical um, advances are often are often not saved. So the documents are very different. Um, so actually tracing certain patents, um, getting access to certain corporate archives um, are not easy. And so these histories take a long time um, and it takes a lot of hard work. And I'm very lucky to be a part of some, um, some methodological experiments where FOIA, which is the freedom, uh, the US system for Freedom of Information Act, so actually through litigation, because um, the tobacco industry and the pharmaceutical industry have um, litigated these cases, a lot of the records are available through these FOIA requests. And so efforts like the US industry docs or toxic docs actually allow public access to certain files, and but also through FOIA requests of my own. And so very lucky in the US to have access to those mechanisms, which take a long time. Um, but methodologically, it is really interesting to look at what is different about chemical corporations, what they save, what they don't save, because the corporate archives also do exist. So what's there um, um, came about prime 1970s and 80s as environmental regulation took hold and corporate chemical archives had really a mission. Um, their mission was to be more transparent to the public, but transparent um, in their own uh, controlled manner. Um, and so what's really interesting to compare and contrast legal litigation with corporate archives, what they actually save, and see those differences and compare and contrast. And that's some of the really fun part, I think, the more exciting part of the historiography of that which is there, that which is saved by chemical corporations, and that which is not, that which is litigated. So to see those different histories and those memos take place is really a, an interesting and fun experiment in architectural historiography. All those memos that are uh, ripped up and flushed down the toilet, right? Uh, rather than <laughs> being safe. Absolutely. Um, uh, are there other questions? Thank you all for coming, by the way. So I, I am not seeing any other questions. Um, so I, I guess I will close and thank everyone for, uh, for coming. And uh, oh, sorry, here's another question. Josh, uh, Josh Lappin, does the oil and gas industry see Dow and other plastics manufacturers as competition in their early years? Excuse me, I'm trying to understand exactly the question. Um, oh yeah, I think. So uh, not necessarily their competition, but um, their profit uh, taker, if you will. I don't think that's a very articulate way to say it, but the reason why Dow Well was founded um, was because Dow understood that its bottom line was being, um, being um, cut. And so you actually began to see why Dow Well was developed um, and actually began to produce its own um, oil and gas um, in its own subsidiary. So it's a really interesting moment when things are starting to, to um, you notice that that's uh, being sidelined and you see the subsidiary companies come into play because they, they understood that production or making chemical compounds wasn't enough for pure profit. Extraction was where the money was. Um, and so seeing Dow Well and its foundation really at the same time that you see and that's why I think this case study is interesting. Um, styrofoam, ubiquitous, slightly boring in the architectural world. But you see ethylene, which was a byproduct of this new oil and gas industry that Dow Well um, was taking part in just at that moment. And so that's why it's incredibly interesting to see yeah, how these things come about and why um, this ubiquitous styrene product became so popular 
was literally just because they were becoming involved in the oil and gas in the oil and gas industry. Heck, of a lot of ethylene. Um, without a lot of use for it. And so the dial physics laboratory and the slot machine, which is always a good um, indication, um, had to find ways to put this product because if they don't take this ethylene, what happens to ethylene? It becomes waste and waste is always expensive. And so the chemical industry is really founded on this idea of no waste and finding um, a place for every molecule. Um, so it's really in the other histories that I actually write about, um, it's a similar um, equation um, in the, I look in the histories in Germany in the dye industry, and that's really the waste of coal or in Monsanto, really looking at um, the waste similarly of um, trying to find oil and gas at that time. So um, waste is expensive, um, why not produced with waste? And every molecule counted in these um, chemical engineering corporations. You can see the chat, right, Jessica? Yeah, I can. Okay, I was just so I looking. Think, yeah, final windows. Uh... Don't come off. Uh, <laughs> so so well. we have Jessica coming in from Texas. Uh, we Texas-based planners are always battling the lobbying power of these industries. Perhaps the most infuriating thing is when they greenwash their customers. Looking at you, vinyl, at you, vinyl windows, and making a more environmentally responsible choice. Jessica, I love your comment, not a question. I'm just joking. Um, it's true, lobbying. And I think what's really interesting too is how the lobbying industries come. I think the NAHB is interesting because it comes from the building and architectural profession. Um, so also lobbying with alongside um, chemical corporations. So um, it's true, it's hard to uh, battle the power. And I, I sort of mentioned the profit numbers that were really dealt with at the time. Um, but they are large when it comes to commissions. Um, so millions and millions of dollars um, versus, um, you know, a smaller architectural field. It's hard to push against. Absolutely. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much, uh, Jessica. That was really fa fantastic and fascinating talk. Uh, thank you to everyone for coming tonight. And we look forward to, uh, to seeing you all at our next lecture. Thank you so much. Absolutely, we leave you with more questions than answers. Yes, <laughs> thanks so much. Thank Have you. Have a great Monday, everyone.